Welcome everybody to the first uh, special guest, uh, international guest that we have on our Game Dev Life Cat podcast, podcast uh, Pavel Budai. Thank you very much, Pavel, for being with us, uh, especially since we got a bit of uh, uh, emotions uh, because uh, we got uh, screwed by the time difference between the countries. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, 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 thank you for uh, for having me. Uh, I have to apologize up front because I thought that it's uh, we are in the same time zone, but then I realized I'm not uh, by the amount of messages that <laughs> no. you have sent me that I probably <laughs> screwed something over. And this is this is usually the thing um, that one hour difference is even worse than eight hour difference. For example, when you are traveling to San Francisco or when you are traveling to Japan. It's always that one hour difference uh, that kind of uh, breaks your whole uh, schedule <laughs> yeah, 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 and yeah. is the most yeah. complicated. But anyway, yeah. we made it and uh, sorry for, for the trouble. No, glad, no problem. Glad you're here now. Yeah, exactly. We are glad you're here. Uh, we uh, have uh, uh, an interesting uh, talk uh, uh, meeting ab- uh, ahead of us because we want to talk uh, uh, more about the games industry in general in 2024. And um, Pavel, um, it's uh, it's a person who uh, does a lot of traveling uh, as part of his his job. Uh, but uh, you, Pavel, uh, globe trotted all all over the world, especially in the last years. Maybe not so more um, recently. But before we jump into today's uh, discussion, uh, we would like for uh, everybody to get to know a bit more uh, and. Please share some some information about yourself. Uh, so, um... I was hoping that the uh, that the host will do it for me because I no. do not like to talk about myself. So you are putting me uh, a little bit under pressure. But anyway, uh, hello everyone once again. Uh, my my name is Pavel. Uh, I have been part of the games industry for more than two decades, uh, and I wore many hats uh, during that time. I started as a journalist uh, that was uh, reviewing games uh, that were not being covered by one of my favorite uh, media in Slovakia. And that was my actually foot in the door. Uh, And since then, uh, I was uh, helping developers with PR and marketing. Uh, I helped them to uh, get together during the meetups. Uh, That led actually to co-found Slovak Game Developers Association with some of the veterans that still exists and that still produce very good content including a conference that is happening in november so if you are kind of if you want to wander uh, around and travel to slovakia there is uh, there is one conference happening at the beginning of november called game days uh and it was just a short uh uh, short kind of a step to a larger stage uh, and organizing international uh, events uh, in croatia in canada in czech republic uh and that led obviously to the current job that i that I have, which is business development manager for Pixel End Games, which is a studio in uh, in Poland, and we are part of a larger group, which is called Sumo Digital. Um, so I, since the beginning, I was traveling a lot, and around uh, around the travels and around the uh, uh, the events that I attended, I managed to meet a lot of people, and uh, I'm still using that connections today, uh, which is basically the backbone of uh any business and especially uh it's very good kind of ammunition to have in your arsenal if you are business developer. oh sure oh sure and i actually i want to do to propose to you officially if you ever okay. need to make a backup to your phone especially your contact in your phone uh my phone is available for you so you can always uh absolutely send, but send, send, send all the contact yeah <laughs> yeah um I'm, i will take Good care of, of everybody uh, over there, uh, Pavel. Uh, can you can you remember roughly which was your like the most crazy year and how many uh, events you attended? Oh, I don't know. Uh, maybe 2018, 2019. Uh, we were counting it, not counting it down, but we were kind of looking at how many also local events were happening around. Um, uh here i mean i live in croatia which which i uh, forgot to mention uh and there has been a lot of uh, a lot of new initiatives popping up before everything was shut down in 2020 but i think it was 2019 as we uh, were organizing reboot develop in banff in a national park in canada and we had to actually travel there multiple times to do the uh location scouting meet with the 
uh, meet with the venue owners, uh, and then obviously go there with the team to organize everything. So I think 2019 was the busiest when it comes to number of long haul flights. Um, and, and in terms of events, like because I I remember I I once saw um, <laughs> a calendar you had. Um, and uh, it it was a huge number of events you attended uh, in that year, but I don't remember exactly what year. I really don't know. Maybe twenty twenty five, if you count also the local ones. Uh, it was more or less every other week I was on the road. Um, yeah. So that's since, nice. since I don't have access uh, to what Andre has access to in terms of like your calendar, <laughs> apparently his. <laughs> Or my contacts. He's <laughs> Andre, yeah. please He's don't steal yeah. my contacts. So <laughs> just tell us about how many events do you tend to attend in a year, like a medium? Yeah, so I, I do have, and this is a very kind of a healthy advice as well, uh, because when you, are, uh, when you are traveling, you can't do work. Even maybe the employer might kind of expect that you will do some work uh, while you're traveling, I don't know, and answering to the important messages. But you do not have that headspace that when you can sit down and um, uh, kind of uh, flex your creative muscles, I don't know, creating a proposal or uh, uh, fleshing out um, a really kind of elaborate email uh, that is asking very difficult questions that you need to have kind of your, your time on your own. Um, and, during my years, I kind of came came down to to a very simple solution to limit it to one event per month, if if it's needed, right? Um, and when you need to uh, when you need to actually travel for work, I would focus on two biggest events or two most important ones to your goals. It doesn't have to be GDC or Gamescom, which is which are actually the landmark events that are the loudest. Um, one happening at the beginning of the year in March and the other, which is the biggest, biggest games industry uh, event in the world uh, in Germany during August. They don't have to be necessarily these two. It can be something local where you can have access uh, to a local talent, where you can pick, uh, pick their brain about, where you can actually learn a lot of, uh, a lot of things uh, from, from your peers when there is no kind of a... Um, language barrier, and then you can actually uh, think uh, uh, think about going abroad or maybe to a neighboring country and visiting um, mm -hmm. visiting an event there, and kind of uh, being exposed to uh, foreigners and obviously learn uh, kind of uh, building your building your network. Um, mm -hmm. So, but if you are traveling a lot, I would limit it to uh, one event per month, and then you have enough time for your family. You have uh, enough time to actually do a proper follow ups. Then you have time also to prepare for the next one. Um, I know. Uh, Pavel, some uh, uh, of... Yeah, go ahead. Finish your idea, and I, I will ask after. Uh... Yeah, I just I just wanted to mention that I know a couple of business developers that are actually always on the road, and they spend probably one month at home. So yeah, yeah. Uh, um... It, it depends, and you you made a good point, uh, which is which is very important, and and I want. For us to break down a bit uh, mm -hmm. that point that you made, because uh, most most of our audience and, and and especially one of the goals of this podcast is to help, uh, especially aspiring developers, to yep. better under understand what game development means from all sides, business or development wise. And um, uh, I, I I would actually go a bit back. Uh, you mentioned the the you you go to the events that you uh, have an objective for. Uh, which uh, I think it's it's a critical question because we in Romania we don't have the habit of going to the events. Uh, m probably the most common thing is that we don't see the reason why to go to an event. Uh, so from experience, and I'm pretty sure that you know you come you, know, you come from uh, Slovakia. Now you're living in Croatia. It is still Eastern Europe or, or Central Europe. It's still a lot of things that we share in common in terms of of you know. Yep. Uh, difficulties and, and issues at community level. Um, so uh, from your experience, why should people go to a conference? I would even go one kind of step further uh, and mention yeah, yeah, that sure. even here, you have people kind of uh, re reluctantly attending events. Yeah. Uh, because for example, it's not in their walking distance or they will come up with, not a stupid excuse, but they will come up with something that kind of, uh, 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 it's not making them to 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 actually attend. 
um, I have been, I have to mention that I have been very lucky uh, since the beginning of my, of my career, even though I was not uh, paid at the beginning, but it was my choice. Um, I was always lucky with the opportunities that were uh, offered uh, and put on my, uh, in, in, on my table. So I always, uh, I always, uh, I'll always be thankful for that. So uh, in my case, making new connections uh, and knowing the ecosystem that is around in, in different countries was very, very important um, because for one simple reason, uh, the contacts or the people that you meet now, they're going to be elsewhere in 10 years. Uh, if they stay in the games industry, they will probably develop their own skills. If they are artists, they might become art director. If they're starting as an aspiring engineer, they might be technical director or there may be CTOs uh, in five, maybe 10 years if they're very, very good. They might be principal, they might be leading teams and they might be hiring, right? Um, mm -hmm. It is very good to have these connections because nowadays you can actually work remotely. You do not have to relocate in many cases. Some companies are still kind of um, thinking about the hybrid model, but there is a lot of them that doesn't actually require yeah. you to uh, to move. So that's one thing. The other one is uh, broadening your horizons. Uh, people from different countries think differently. Even we are coming from the same kind of a part region. of the Europe, mm. part of the re same region. We think differently, right? We are living in different time zones, uh, for example. That's that, that's one of the one of the differences. <laughs> yeah. But we do have different different uh, cultural backgrounds, right? We do share uh, different history. Uh, we are looking at even the same things very differently. And that can actually help you to come up with creative ways how to uh, face challenges, how to solve problems, uh, how to actually connect with other people, with other people, right? Because for example, if you're meeting uh, someone from Cluj or someone from, uh, from Bucharest, you can actually use, I don't know, slang, you can use different, uh, different words and you can actually connect much more faster. Yeah. Um, and obviously you are learning, learning a lot through things doing together. Uh, while, I don't know, enjoying food or uh, mm -hmm. going for a drink or going on a sightseeing. It's, uh, for me, it's essential, right? Mm -hmm. Because my job is to know as many people as possible and, and, and utilize the network and help others to be connected as well. Um, the reason why people doesn't want to, you can't actually force people to attend events. Uh, this is something that we learned the hard way as well. Uh, we had a similar issue in, in Slovakia when, our smaller conference was part of a animation festival uh, that was actually attracting very skilled people that could be employed by um, uh, games industry uh, and, and the studios that were lacking in art direction or they were lacking in, in, in high quality animation. Uh, but we still, we actually failed to, to convince uh, convince the developers to to go there, which was not in a capital city. It might be that uh, we mm. do not know. And actually, at this point, we we really don't care uh, because it was their fault. Uh, we had a very good time. Uh, we invited international guests. They had an amazing time as well. Um, so I really do not have any uh, any kind of a yeah. ten step guide like how to <clears throat> how to follow and 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 what you need to do. Uh, if you are actually uh, studying or you are kind of interested in uh, in games industry and you're kind of thinking about uh, signing up uh, for a program or kind of looking to self-educate yourself uh, via multiple videos that you can find on, on, on YouTube. And I'm sure that you are providing as well uh, a lot of uh, very insightful, uh, insightful um, uh, content. Uh, I would go there uh, just out of curiosity um, and maybe compare notes. Uh, you might yeah. actually start facing challenges that you won't be able to solve uh, through videos or through, I don't know, GitHub or through forums. Uh, you will get to a point where you'll be lost and you might actually lose the mm, will to continue and the events can actually bring it back because events in many ways are inspiring. Uh, you have a lot of uh, a lot of different topics are being uh, discussed through panels and sessions. And also you are exposed to dozens and maybe even hundreds of other uh, attendees who will, might be working on either a similar solution or they actually mm -hmm. already, already had it and they can tell you, like, yeah, you have to do this and this and you will be uh, exactly. out, of your, yeah. out of your rut. So there is a if lot you, of multiple... 
there are multiple Sorry, ways no. how you can actually look at uh, uh, yeah. look at it. Uh, I would obviously encourage uh, everybody to uh, to join uh, at least once to see how it is. Uh, but events, as you know, uh, can be a little bit uh, overwhelming as well. Uh, they might be kind of scary, especially for those who are introverted. Uh, uh, and it's a good way to have someone on your side who can guide you uh, and maybe do some. And may, let's let's use that person as a as an icebreaker to introduce mm -hmm. you to someone uh, who you can talk to. Other way how to uh, uh, how to look at events is uh, maybe review your portfolio. Uh, if you're an artist, uh, there are a lot of artists and established established uh, developers who are already working on uh, on big titles. They might actually help you uh, improve uh, your yeah. portfolio. So, uh, and job hunting is a, is another uh, is another way uh, when you are finishing university or when you are finishing your high school and you are very skilled and you are looking what is out there. It's also a good opportunity to uh, start talking to uh, to people uh, at events. Um, based on, on again on on your experience attending uh, so many events. Uh, you you mentioned you know an easy route but uh let's let's go the hard way because if you have somebody who can be an icebreaker definitely makes things uh 100 easier but let's go with the fact that you don't have somebody who can yep. be an icebreaker uh what would be like you know um two three tips um because like, again i'm going to um somebody who's like really you know beginning uh he's, he's he, he has a bit of money he wants to go to an event Yep. Um, what would be your advice towards that person or mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, those, you know, one, two days sitting there to make yeah. it as valuable for him? Um, uh, because uh, I'm pretty sure, you know, uh, like you said, events are overwhelming. Uh, yep. You are scared by seniority mm -hmm. and, and you don't want to make a fool of yourself. So you don't ask questions. You don't, um, uh, you know, go to people and then say hi because you're you're maybe introverted how can you break these barriers that basically hinder you uh, you uh, and and uh, you know should i strictly like take a shot of vodka and go to the people and say hi or should i <laughs> um what can i do or what should i should i make an agenda and like do the best to to yeah i i, I definitely I, I definitely red rum vodka. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't red recommend red do vodka. that. I wouldn't recommend do that. Uh, <laughs> it is a perfect recipe for disaster because you might be actually <laughs> anxious. You might be anxious and you might be actually uh, falling to kind of solutions that are not providing any shortcuts. Um, the thing with uh, uh, making friends or make, I, I call it making friends professionally um, mm -hmm. because you are not going to invite first when you are going to meet with them you're not going to invite them to a birthday party uh it is the same as uh, as in real life right uh, the difference between uh meeting uh, developers uh outside in i don't know uh, uh, a restaurant or a cafe and at an event is the is the size right so let's say you already have your budget set and you mm -hmm. might actually be looking at traveling to event and you are looking at the hotels and everything else you should actually start planning what you what are you trying to actually achieve uh, at the event right if it's uh, if you are looking for a jobs then take a look at the event if it provides some uh, kind of a job board or if uh, if you have access to attending companies maybe look at who from those companies are attending um, and don't be maybe afraid meet, to actually meet and match a meet and match with also Precisely, Catalan. Precisely, yes. You might have uh, uh, meet to match access way ahead uh, to the event. Uh, you might actually, uh, if you are bold enough, you can actually go to LinkedIn and ask uh, the companies or companies' representatives, like, "Hey, I saw that you are attending this event. Uh, I have a question regarding, I don't know, engineering. I'm student uh, and." I'm looking for for some answers. They might not answer you, but this is also a good way how to how you can mm -hmm. actually train uh, train uh, to icebreak. The other way is look at the venue or look at the location of where the event is happening, and look on Google Maps what's around it. Right? Uh, if there are cool spots to see, if there is a 
uh, if there is a cool restaurant or if there is a cool bistro, because people like to actually go and eat yeah, food. Exactly. Uh, they are looking for recommendations, and you might be the one who will be asked like, "Hey, uh, we are new here. Uh, do you know any any cool location where we can actually uh, eat food?" And you can say, like, "Yeah, there is one around the corner. Come with me." And immediately you actually made friends. Um, the the other thing, uh, what is very important, is that do not be afraid uh, of uh, seniority. Uh, because we are actually all people. Uh, we are not kind of a, um, uh, put on a pedestal uh, or anything like that. Even the, uh, the industry legends are the same. Uh, we can talk about the weather uh, as with your neighbor or anybody else. Um, so I would say that uh, these kind of things will kind of create a barrier between you and potentially some industrial legend and if you are a very uh, huge fan just ask them for autograph or ask them very stupid question like are you here for the first time me as well have you seen anything yeah. interesting right because uh they don't, if don't they are ask visiting, them for money no 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 don't uh, obviously <laughs> not ask them for uh, for money or anything like that and, <clears throat> and obviously uh, there are kind of no stupid questions but make sure that you you uh, you are actually yeah. aligning with your goals right uh, yeah. don't make fool of yourselves Obviously, respect everybody uh, and treat everyone as you would like to be treated uh, at an event, which is uh, which is something that sometimes we we tend to forget uh, um, at different times. Uh, but the most important ones are the goals, uh, and try to actually write them down in a in a smart way, meaning that you can kind of measure them uh, if you were successful. So if you are trying to um, build your network, then write it down during these two days, I want to meet or I want to make five meaningful connections and I want to have, I don't know, 10 very nice conversations. Uh, it's really achievable, it's measurable. And then at the end, you can actually uh, reevaluate uh, if you if you were actually successful or not. Same goes for, uh, for job hunting. If you are looking for a job, usually at events are HR rep representatives. Um, mm you can actually measure that as well. Talk to five uh, HR, uh, HR representatives or actually go to 10 sessions and ask 10 questions uh, when you are learning and kind of broadening your, uh, your horizon. There are multiple ways how you can, um, uh, how you can do that. And obviously it, it comes down to what type of event you are attending. Not all events are the same, not all events have the, yeah. uh, have the components. Um, and I would start with a local one because you might actually know someone there. You might actually be a little bit uh, more. Um, you might actually uh, have information about the local industry. You might actually know the games mm -hmm. that the companies did. And you might actually start with that. Hey, I'm a huge fan of uh, door kickers. Uh, how did you create it? I don't know the sound uh, in it. And yeah, bam, yeah. you have a question and you can actually start, uh, start having a conversation like this. Yeah. Uh, I I I one hundred percent agree, and I think uh, uh, this this advice is really helpful. Uh, it makes makes it easier for everybody. So you know, uh, uh, as a nice breaker for you, write uh, write your goals, write write a plan of action uh, to make sure that uh, you stick to to your goals and actually uh, manage to to achieve uh, what you plan for. Um, Moving forward on this topic, uh, Pavel. I, I want uh, to ask also ask something that is quite related to what Pavel said until now. Uh, sure. Because I, I totally agree with you that conferences can be truly inspiring. They can motivate you. They can put your work in context. But in terms of uh, indie developers, like indie teams, mm -hmm. uh, we tend to have quite limited budget. And going yes. to at least an international conference it tends to be quite costly and sometimes mm. that cost can represent a big chunk from our from our budget uh how do we convince more developers that that cost is not wasted that it, it's a good investment and how can they make sure that they get a good return on investment on that on that cost what are like the the most important things you know, business-wise, that you can get out out of a of a conference. Because sure, inspiration is great, but when you have yeah. a very limited budget, that's not going to pay the bills, right? Uh, talks Absolutely. are also amazing, but you can find hundreds of them on YouTube. So, 
you know that's true that's true and we are kind of living in a completely different different times after after covid many of uh, um there are multiple ways how you can actually be at an event and you don't have to travel uh a lot of there are a lot of showcases around so if you already have something built if you already have for example a steam page and you may have um already a demo built and you can actually go out there are there are actually multiple ways how you can sign in for showcases uh usually there are uh, free of charge uh, for submission some of them are actually asking for a submission fee which is not a huge uh, huge amount um it is ranging from $50 to 250 um, which is still less when you would uh, travel somewhere travel, uh, yeah, and, yeah. Ha and have a hotel yeah. and buying a uh, buying um, buying a conference ticket. And on top, a lot of these events have a Steam page attached uh, to it, right? And in this age, uh, community and wish lists are everything. So in this sense, you are actually building your, uh, your wish list uh, immediately. While whilst uh, if you would be at an event, the wish list would be, uh, and there is no Steam page uh, where these games are being showcased. Uh, the wish list is not growing that that fast, right? Um, so I would actually look at what are other events uh, out there that are offering for indies uh, showcasing without participation on site, because there are some that have all these all these components mentioned. But they still will require to be uh, on site, so you have to actually travel uh, to these. In this sense, I would actually pick just one, uh, stick with it because they are actually costly. Uh, and when you look at cost effectiveness, in this sense, uh, I would stick with the virtual ones. Uh, mm -hmm. There is tons of them. Obviously, the big one is uh, Steam Next Fest, which is getting more and more uh, overcrowded. I think the one that is right now running has around three thousand demos, which is ridiculous i remember when it started this was around seven or eight hundred so it yeah. grew it grew very very quickly um and in this in this case you can have the demo on a steam next fest only once so you can't repeat it so you have to be really really careful uh with planning uh and read all the small letters as well because well uh, you can't repeat your uh, um your attendance in this uh in this event um so I would I would go for this. I would actually sign up for awards as well. If you have a game that is well developed and you are kind of in the last part of the development, awards are also a great way how you can uh, expose yourself and expose your game to larger audience. Usually, awards are also tied to uh, Steam events uh, or a Steam page. Um, so that's that's also another another good um, um, good avenue how to how to bring more eyeballs or more players uh, to your game. So traveling to events is not necessary. Uh, if if you have, I don't know, a publisher attached to a game, then sure, there might be some PR beat or kind of marketing uh, marketing beat around it. So uh, you go and do interviews and you meet with the media. Um, and if you have to, uh, if you have to actually choose one event, uh, then I would actually look at what kind of audience is attending that event. Uh, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a different audience at PAX than at the than at a, at a conference uh, in canada right it's a different audience at uh, uh let's say uh game developer session which is happening in prague in december and at gamescom right or at a uh, dev play in uh, in bucharest yeah. it's there yeah. there are still the events that are focused on professionals but they have completely uh, different audience well, I, I I won't let you uh, get away that easy. Uh, so I, I, unfortunately, I I will push uh, on on this question um, because I want to see if I can squeeze a, a more clear answer from you. But you for, want me to for, point fingers? For, 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 yeah, I, I I I want to point fingers. Actually, I'm 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 looking for uh, in terms of advice for for uh, uh -huh. that's why I'm bringing more context to the question. If you're an, a small indie developer, you know you have money for to go to only one event. Let's say it's an event in Europe, um, mm -hmm. uh, and you want to showcase your game because you want to attract wish lists, you want to attract publishers, you want to attract uh, media. What Gamescom. event would you recommend? Gamescom. Gamescom. Yes. Okay. Gamescom and has uh, not only the think, biggest. 
Yeah, do, do you think Gamescom is also the best for attracting publishers and investors? Uh, yes, uh, the, the Gamescom attracts, I think, the biggest number of business people in the world. Uh, not even GDC can measure that. GDC is too far. It's way too expensive. I mean, yeah. Cologne during Gamescom is, is, can get expensive as well, especially yeah. with the accommodation, not traveling there. But you have different options how you can cut down the cost and not live in the city, but live in, a, let's say, uh, Netherlands. In, in Bonn, and you can actually use a train. You don't have to actually live in the Netherlands and then use car, but you can do that as well. I actually, have... last year uh, or this year, uh, I don't remember exactly, I had friends who actually stayed at the border in Netherlands and traveled by car to... to yeah, it's, it, it, is, it, is, uh, it is very tricky, but there are workarounds uh, how, you can, yeah. how you can save, uh, save costs and accommodation. Accommodation is the biggest, uh, is the biggest cost related yeah. to Gamescom. Um, you have probably all the publishers there, all the scouts are there, not just from Europe, uh, from US, from Asia. Um, plus you have tons of, uh, uh, tons of initiatives that are specifically tied to Indies, uh, starting with DEF COM. They do a lot of, uh, a lot of networking parts. They do a lot of showcases as well. Obviously, the big one is Indie Game Arena uh, that is uh, being in Hall 10 uh, in, at Gamescom, which is huge. I think they had 170 games this year. There are another initiative that was just across the uh, across the um, uh, the walkway, uh, which was on a, which was another booth with 30 or 40 games. Um, there is a lot of actually options how you can uh, expose uh, your game, and also it's very important that if you are looking for wish lists. You want to be in consumer area, uh, not in the business area. In business area, yes, it's kind of good to meet uh, publishers, uh, maybe investors, uh, or actually uh, have uh, meaningful conversations with media and influencers. But when it comes to the wish list, wish list, it's uh, it's kind of a necessity to be exposed to the thousands of people who are flocking into Gamescom and they're trying to actually play as many and as many games as possible. Uh, Gamescom, I would, I would say, I would say is very important. There are other big events that are attracting a lot. There has been, there has been, there has been actually two events in UK. One was called Resd, uh, the other one was called WASD, which was a spin-off of Resd. Yeah. Yeah. These two were focused uh, focused only on indies, which was absolutely amazing because you could talk to Nintendo, you could talk to PlayStation, you could talk to Xbox. It was not crowded. It was only a couple of thousand people uh, during the weekend. But when you were exhibiting there, it was absolutely beautiful. Um, so these two events uh, no longer exist. I hope that they will bring it back, at least the WASD. There is also the new uh, Eurogamer Expo, EGX, uh, which is part of a reach pop. They are organizing packs. They are organizing comic cons. This is also a huge event, a uh, huge event uh, attended by tens of thousands of people. It's not as big as Gamescom uh, and it's happening in UK, which might be, I don't know cost of how cost effective it is, but it will be cheaper to go to EGX than to Gamescom. But I really do not know how the how the show uh, show has changed um, during the years. If, if we move more to the uh, Eastern Europe uh, region, Poland, yeah. um, uh, Croatia, um, 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 Serbia has some events, uh, Nordic countries have uh, events. Uh, uh, so we are still talking about wish lists, correct? Or investors yeah, and publishers? Yeah, yeah. Let, let's, let's try to pick one for each. One for each? Uh, <laughs> um, Andre, are you, are you trying to get him to say that Dev Play is the best event to attend? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, no, I, I, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really trying to, to, to help because um, I put myself Look, in uh, the shoes of somebody who's like 21, just finished uh, uh, yes. uni university. I'm, I don't know so much about the industry. You know, there are hundreds, thousands of people who don't know about Dev Play, though it's happening next door to them. Um, they don't know what to choose where to go, what's interesting mm. for them. You know, we said make goals, but actually making goals, it's complicated. It uh, is. Because you uh, don't know what it is important for you at 21. So, and, and um, also, Andre, and also it's really, uh, really important to say that uh, when you are just relying on one event, you are actually asking for a disappointment. 
Mm. Um, that's good. right because that's good. Interesting. what because what if you are not meeting with the three publishers that you kind of yeah, came yeah, up yeah. with your in your head, right? Um, yeah. Because in the end, they might tell you like, and you might actually meet with them, and they will tell you, "Oh, we have a submission form on your web uh, on our website. Just submit the game there." Yeah. Uh, which could be the case. Uh, actually, uh, Pavel, uh, don't don't. <laughs> um, I, I'm still pushing. Sorry for that. Uh, no, don't worry. This, uh, don't worry. This is this is a good question, and I I, I want actually. So, so first, let's let's see if we can find an answer to what's interesting in Eastern Europe for uh, looking for wishlists or looking for your publishers yes. or investors, and then maybe you can explain uh, or or be, uh, exp tell us from your experience how to cope with uh, a disappointing uh, event. Okay, so let's start focusing on the on the wishlist slash publishers. Mm -hmm. um, there is Poznan Game Arena, I think, which is the I think the largest here in our area when it comes to number of people uh, attracting and being exposed to games, they do have pretty large indie um, indie zone where you can actually exhibit. Mm -hmm. uh, they have various options for tables and booths. There is also a conference attached to it, uh, which is kind of bringing um, uh, professionals. They are kind of separated, so they are not in the same room. Uh, so I would kind of consider maybe Poznan Game Arena. Uh, I haven't been there for, I think, four years, so I do not know how it changed. Mm -hmm. um, but it is still pulling in a large amount of numbers, uh, number of attendees. Then you have huge events that are uh, that are attached to big cities, but there might be a language barrier. Milan Games Week, Paris Games Week, uh, and uh, Madrid Games Week. Uh, I know that Paris Games Week... There is a new initiative that is connecting directly publishers and investors with the indies and with the creators of games. Um, it is an invite-only event. They are launching it uh, alongside Paris Games Week. Uh, but in these cases, you have to be uh, kind of prepared to pay for your mm. table, pay for your booth uh, to be there, right? Um, and uh, when it comes to... Uh, meeting publishers and, uh, and and talking to them. It depends to whom you want to uh, to whom you want to talk to, with whom you want to connect. Because not at every event you will have PlayStation or you will have Nintendo representatives or you will have Devolver and Raw Fury and uh, and these uh, well established brands. Uh, so in this case, I might. Uh, utilize your social network. Scouts are there. They're listed on Twitter. They always actually go for uh, retweets and, and they are promoting other interesting ideas. Uh, they are browsing through Steam. Uh, so Steam page is, I think, a must. Maybe we will talk about it, like what's very mm -hmm. important for, for publishers, uh, publishers to see. But if you want to just meet with them and hang out with them, there are multiple events where you can just bump into them. Gamescom is one, obviously. Um, you might not find them in the exhibition halls, but they are usually in a different hotels, in a different lobbies. But that's, I think, another uh, kind of a topic on how to tackle business development and not to be overwhelmed <laughs> or, or disappointed. Um, Reboot in Croatia is uh, is pretty nice, I heard. Uh, I was uh, yeah, I was, I I was organizing I it. About it. <laughs> I don't know. And, uh, and I'm and I'm biased. I've been, only, I've been to only six editions, so they, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. But you, as I, I mentioned, the uh, Paris Games Week has a new initiative, which is actually tailored, focused on on indies and connecting them with uh, with publishers. The smaller event it is, the more higher quality of conversations you will have with uh, with these. Uh, representatives who are going to be there. Usually you have also initiatives uh, from trade bodies, different states have different, uh, different states, different countries have different associations and trade bodies. And usually they are organizing uh, publishers trips, uh, either around the event that they are uh, having for the public. They are bringing in five to six publishers uh, meeting with, uh, with, the, uh, with the local talent, usually through pitching, pitching session, and they are being exposed uh, to um, to the games that they are uh, being created in the, uh, in the specific country. Mm. Um, so that might be another way how to actually sneak in and piggyback on someone else's uh, initiative if, if it's available for for public to attend. 
Nice. Cool. Lovely. I, I got an answer. Uh, now let's go to the hard, uh, harder part. Uh, let's Disappointment. Say you, know, you, you, you use all your money to go to an event. You meet nobody or whatever reasons. Uh, that event is disappointing. Yeah. Um, you usually have the habit of saying like everything is like this. I won't do it anymore. Uh, and, it happened. Uh, it happened a couple of times. I uh, I would be lying uh, if I would say otherwise. Um, but it comes down again to preparations, right? And not specifically to to the goals that we have been talking about. Uh, sometimes the luck is swung the other way, and maybe even the meetings that you kind of pre-agreed to, they uh, they didn't happen. They might be canceled. They might be, I don't know, no shows, right? Uh, in some cases, uh, you can get ghosted. Uh, so you have a really nice conversation before. And then when you need to kind of commit to, to a meeting or commit to a, uh, having a call, suddenly the person is uh, nowhere to be found. You do not know, right, what's happening. Uh, it is not about that you are um uh, that it's you uh that's the usually kind of how our brain works oh think that this is an excuse it's, it's not you it's, it's me it's our <laughs> fault yeah but you really do not know right what might happen it's true, um, it's true, it's true. um i really do not know like how to how to can actually respond to that i walk a lot so when something like this happens then i'm trying to uh evaluate why it, it, did, hmm. did it happen what was wrong if it was my fault if it was the uh i don't know the weather if it was i don't know the traffic if it was the quality of people that were attending the event because you might have different experience next time uh when you go and then suddenly something happens you meet someone interesting and that someone will lead you to amazing conversation right but you can't bet on serendipity serendipity or how yeah, do you yeah, say yeah. that you yeah. can't actually you can't actually bet on it because it's unpredictable. It can happen. It sometimes it doesn't happen, uh, and sometimes uh, you have a very amazing meeting or conversation on the sidewalk while you are walking to a meeting. That happened to me multiple times. Uh, I managed to actually uh, get a sponsor on board while while we were walking to a different event. It was not prearranged. We just met each other, say said hello, and then we just pitch to each other, like what we are doing and like, oh, okay, let's do it. Um, so I wouldn't rely too much on it. Uh, it's, uh, it is, I think, part of our life to be disappointed. There is always a learning in it. So look at it from the bright side that you might actually have, I don't want to say like really bad experience at events, but they might be uh, in some ways disappointing. Um, but that that but doesn't it, mean that every edition is the same. No, of course, every each edition is different. Each each uh, edition of the same event uh, exactly. is bringing and attracting <laughs> different people. It is attracting different uh, different uh, the whole crowd, um, different guests, different speakers, uh, different games, uh, and you are meeting. Uh, you are actually going there in different time, and your headspace is different than exactly. the year before, right? Yeah, if I if I can add something. It's like, you know, making anything, like making games. If you expect that you're going to make a game and you're going to be successful from the first time, you're just setting yourself up for disappointment. Mm -hmm. But it, I think it's exactly the same with conferences. If you just go to your first conference and you expect you're going to get like the biggest deal signed and you're going to meet <laughs> all of these industry legends and they're all going to follow you on Twitter and whatever, that's kind of weird. You need to get experience with these things too so that you, like you said, that you know how to put yourself in a certain yeah. mindset that you know how to talk to people, how to spot opportunities and so on and so on. So you need to attend more to get that kind of experience. Absolutely. But there is also the, the different side, or I would say like the dark side of uh, attending events. Attending events can be a little bit addictive uh, because you are meeting new friends and you have uh, fun, you're uh, going for uh, nice mixers, you have uh, maybe a party or two. Uh, and then you are actually, uh, before you say goodbye, like, where are you heading next? And you will actually head there as well because you made new friends and you are doing it as well. But then you actually need to think about that someone needs to do the work uh, back home. Someone needs to actually make sure that you are on the right track with 
your project or with uh, with the company that you are trying to set up uh, or with your life uh, right because it is uh, it it can be uh, it can be uh, addictive to just travel and uh, and have fun uh, with your new friends that's why it's good for us you know developers to hire someone who's going to have all the fun for us while we pay them help for having fun right so, <laughs> i mean that's why biz devs that, were invented right <laughs> yes that's a that's another way of looking at it but also you have those that are playing it smartly and they just do the work and then they kind of skip the fun uh, and do something uh, smaller on the side like a dinner or invite their friends to i don't know a board game or uh, paint minifigures, which I like to do, uh, for example, in the evenings, um, which is a different, different kind of a uh, way of networking and different, different way of uh, getting to know the people. Otherwise, you would be exposed to a loud environment, for example. Um, Pavel, uh, before uh, we switch uh, with our discussion to the second yep. topic we wanted to cover, which is publisher, uh, publishers, and and uh, to be more precise, money. Um, I want to take uh, a couple of questions that we received. Uh, I also want to let everybody know that if uh, uh, you want to send us questions, um, please uh, please do it uh, and um, don't be shy. Also, uh, because more than 90% of our views come from offline uh, viewing of, of the podcast. Um, yeah. Also, you can write the questions in the comments um we'll um uh talk with pavel and uh, uh ask him to to answer those questions as well and uh, you can we'll reach out to uh, linkedin to my linkedin as well if you if you're not shy uh just reach out to me on linkedin if you have yeah. any any question yeah. and you saw this recording so shout out to everyone who was watching it from recording uh, so one question we received from Radu, uh, who's asking that uh, lately more games have appeared which explore culture closer to the East. I feel uh, like our culture is insufficiently explored. I believe he's mentioning Romanian culture or Eastern European culture. Mm -hmm. um, could this be an advantage for us Eastern Europeans? Does Pavel agree? Um, what do you think, Pavel? I agree. Uh, I totally agree. Uh, there are a couple of, uh, couple of people uh, out there who are uh, studying this or they're trying to actually um, bring more or actually expose uh, the creators to be more inclusive specifically to uh, cultures that might be actually dying out and one of the example and this is uh, um, this is a self-promotion plug uh, our group has uh, let's do it we uh, need money <laughs> uh, we have a studio in our group called the chinese room uh the dear esther uh, developers and they recently uh recently a couple of months ago they released still wakes the deep um which is set on an oil rig uh during i think 70s or 80s uh please don't kill me uh if i'm wrong um and it is set uh on a scottish uh oil rig uh and they did original uh voiceover as an alternative in gaelic uh mm. and uh, mm -hmm. It is a language that is almost extinct. Only a couple of hundred people uh, speak with this. Uh, Which uh, probably don't play video games, but <laughs> uh, probably. But they are actually coming from these uh, from from these cultural backgrounds, right? Their grandparents mm -hmm. uh, might might have uh, spoken, and they might actually speak it as well. Uh, so you have these kind of instances where things like this can. Uh, make or break uh, the experience and add kind of a layer of authenticity uh, mm. to this. I, I haven't finished the game yet, uh, but I'm actually playing it with the uh, Gaelic voiceover. Uh, right. It is completely different. So you have to turn on the subtitles mm. because obviously you do not understand that. Similarly to, uh, this is an obvious uh, example, Witcher, right? Uh, but even the, fir in the, even the first one and the second one, um you could play in a in a polish voiceover original uh original uh yeah. voiceover and and it did and it's and it kind of uh uh it sounds different uh it sounds like the books uh it sounds very eastern european right so there are a lot of ways how you can uh, how you can do it obviously you want to expose your game to as many people as possible 
So you have to think about that as well. So you can't actually create a game about, um, I don't know, a weird corner in the city. Um, and because only people who are actually know about it or who are actually living yeah, when, close when to it might, it might actually understand it. So mm. in that case, it needs to be, it needs to be uh, accessible. Uh, Disco Elysium is another great example. Uh, the art direction is Eastern European, right? Uh, yeah. Dishonored as well. Uh, which was, uh, um, I, was I, uh, I actually remember uh, while, while you were speaking I, I remember that I, I was in some meetings uh, when, when I was working at Ubisoft mm -hmm. um, uh, for the Ghost Recon franchise uh, and there were some like really really um, dedicated uh, meetings on where does a game take place Yeah, and, and I remember that the Hitty debate was uh, in, in terms of like people don't know about this location. And I remember, yeah. for example, we were discussing about Bolivia and, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's not like Middle East. No, uh, everybody like, you know, you have uh, the, the, the games like usually between, you, you know, Russia, uh, yeah. China, US. And like people were from marketing was like, no, 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 let's not do Bolivia because like nobody know where Bolivia is and what it is. And, uh, and there were like a couple of weeks for for like choosing a location. Where does this action take place? And we need to make sure that we can find a location that people can relate to. Even I mean, you are absolutely correct. But there are big games uh, like Stalker, uh, the upcoming one, um, Heart of Chernobyl, which which is set obviously in Ukraine, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in the in the zone around uh, Chernobyl. Exactly. Uh, also, Kingdom Come, uh, which was developed in, in Czech Republic. When I was playing it, I knew that I am in the woods, that I was uh, I was there as a kid, because the mm. trees uh, are uh, are actually growing in my part of the country mm. as well. Mm. Um, so you have these little things. It, as I mentioned, voiceover can uh, can bring this, uh, or actually can expose um, some of the weird uh, languages or weird kind of. Uh, language that is being spoken in, in certain part of the world. Um, it can be uh, this, uh, the signs on the store. Uh, I know that Deus Ex was, and even Call of Duty had a map uh, in Prague. Forza Motorsport had a track in Prague. Uh, yeah. And it was one of my favorite tracks because like, you could see the landmarks uh, in Prague and you felt actually you are at home. Um, so these things, even the games are very accessible and being played mm -hmm. by millions of players they still have that uh, feeling they still have the heart uh, and the soul uh, in the country where they were developed i, I think that's Thank you. very cool for like for us people in eastern europe because when we see the locations that you can't, we're kind of familiar with is great for us but yep. I, I would look at it from the other side do you think like focusing some of our games on our local cultures do you think that's appealing enough for western audiences because at the end of the day, Western audiences are the ones that generate the most revenue, right? Sure. Uh, it is definitely interesting. It comes how you want to tell the story. Uh, our, I mean, uh, each country in Europe is different. Uh, it has, it might share some of the architecture. Uh, it might share some of the uh, stores uh, or storefronts because they are kind of a, um, globalized corporations. But the people who are living there have different stories. Uh, they went through uh, different kind of cultural shifts. Uh, there was still the communism in a lot of uh, a lot of the countries we were living behind the Arnon curtain. So uh, these kind of stories, um, I think, are waiting to be kind of retold. We just need to find them. Yeah. Uh, and if the story is very gripping, it's it doesn't matter where it where it happens because it comes down to. Uh, the individuals, it comes down to how complicated the characters are. Um, and you can actually uh, relate to them uh, because if it's told right, then uh, you're not looking at a hero movie, but you're looking at or actually experiencing a, a story of ordinary people. This war of mine is perfect example. Uh, again, right? Uh, mm -hmm. It is done by Polish 11-bit studio and they, are, they have been inspired by uh, um, horrible war uh, in Yugoslavia and specifically in Sarajevo, which was uh, yeah. cut from the rest of the world. Yeah. 
So basically, <coughs> the way I look at it is use unique locations, unique environments, unique cultures, but then tell the story with familiar themes so that everyone can relate to them. I think that's the best approach. Like familiar yeah, themes yeah. in unique, unique settings. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's let's switch to the to the publisher uh, part of the discussion uh, because we we uh, as developers need um, their support to to uh, transform our games into successful story. Uh, and uh, we received a question about this, uh, but I don't want to ask to answer uh, uh, right now because uh, I would like to mm -hmm. take, take some steps until we get to to. To, to that game, but uh, basically I wanted you to know that we are leading to a precise, we want the exact number with dots and digits and everything, <laughs> how many um, wish list we need to, to show. But before we go there, um, yeah. let's, let's start with the beginning. So uh, once again, I am new, I just started industry, I created my first game, I have my first demo, or I don't have my first demo, actually you tell yes. us. But um, I want to get a publisher. So the first question is, um, what do I want or what should I share or tell or show to a publisher to get him to reply to me? And I will answer with a question. Why do you need a publisher? I don't know. Mostly, I think it's money. Mo mo like most of developers, I'd say it's money. Okay. Like the, okay. the smartest answer would be for their experience to bring your game to a larger audience. Yes. But, you know, most people would say because we need the money. <laughs> that's so that's my say, answer, but you can answer Katalin now. <laughs> so, so let's say you have, uh, you have a team that is very passionate about their game. They want to start actually making that game. Uh, they might be studying at the university, but they have a lot of time at their, at their disposal. I would recommend them to actually have a minimal viable product, which might be a vertical slice, which might be a demo, uh, and invest as many, uh, as many hours as possible to make it as polished as possible uh, experience. Test it on your friends, not just your kind of loved ones, because they will tell you, oh, it's great but test it wide, uh, cast the net really wide. And if you still have the kind of support from, uh, from your parents that you can still return back and still have the roof over your head, you can have, um, uh, do you have access to food? Do not sign a publisher if, uh, uh, if you're kind of beginning. If you don't uh, and you are on your own, then it's a different thing. Um, times are very rough uh, currently. Publishers are asking almost, um, they're asking things that are almost impossible to deliver. Uh, Sometimes they're asking you for, oh, if you do not have 100,000 wish lists, we can't do anything for you, right? But in at that point, if you have 100K, the question is, why do you need a publisher, right? Um, so they are actually, um, a lot of publishers out there, it depends on your genre, it depends on the budget you're looking for, it depends on your timeline, it depends on so many things. Plus you do have companies that are doing uh, white label publishing. They will provide you all the tools necessary to succeed uh, when it comes to marketing, when it comes to PR. They might actually be able to secure you uh, a porting studio or to uh, have a QA and a localization. Uh, and they will actually fo not force you, but they will actually guide you to self uh, through the self-publishing process uh, in the end. And you do not actually lose the 50% uh, or 60% that you are actually given away uh, to publisher. Um, the agreements currently are very rough. Uh, publishers, you have to kind of think about they are recouping first, recouping meaning that the investment that they're investing in you after you start selling a, a, selling a game they are actually uh, taking the money first. So you are basically getting zero. Uh, and after they recoup, you're actually uh, sharing the, the revenue uh, with them still, um, which is uh, in, in some ways uh, very exploitative. Uh, and publishers are aware that a lot of, there is a lot of content. There is a lot of games that need the support. 
so they might corner uh, some of the um, some of the indies. <laughs> if you are actually in that kind of a position and you are talking to one or two publisher, reach out to more uh, or actually ask people in community uh, if they can look at your agreement or if they can kind of compare. Uh, it's something that uh, it is um, it is doable. Plus, you do have publishers who openly share their agreements, so you can actually go through what kind of uh, uh, criteria they have uh, and what they need uh, from you when uh, uh, when you sign an agreement with you. Um, and then you can actually compare. So there is a lot of resources and there is also a lot of people who can uh, help you navigate. It is very complicated. It's not easy to pick a partner because this is not something that once you have a publisher, you are kind of uh, uh, golden. Uh, it is a relationship and it will actually last until uh, the game is pulled from the store. Uh, so you have to think about that. So it's more about a very long-term relationship, almost like a marriage. Uh, <coughs> obviously, yeah, there, long-term there commitment. Might, indeed. Yeah, it, it might be, there might be some, uh, I don't want to say fights, but there might be some cave cats where you're not going to agree, but that's, I think, part of, uh, part of life, but you need to be very, very careful. I would start definitely with the question, why do you need a publisher? And if the answer is money, money you can get from other institutions. Uh, you do have sometimes public grants. Not sure how this how is the situation in Romania. Zero. But you do, uh, okay. <laughs> Similar as uh, as in as in other Eastern no, I, European. No, Pavel, uh, I, I will be a bit more blunt. Um, yes. Some of the reasons. I'm I'm pretty sure you know each each studio has its own reason, but. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, um, we see studios which are usually small looking for a publisher. Yep. Why? Because they don't have time to do marketing. They don't know and they don't want to do marketing. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, we live That's in fair. an era, actually 2024, uh, if I remember from an, an, an older episode we did, uh, it's the year with the most games uh, on, on Steam. So the noise is probably the loudest yes. as ever. So you need somebody to help you make you a bit more visible yep. and you don't know how to do it, how to do it. You don't know how to write to, to influencers. You don't know to, how to approach them. There are so many unknowns, especially when you're 2021 20, first, yep. maybe a uh, second game. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so basically you're looking for somebody to help you. That's a, a lot of people seeing publishers, somebody True. will help them uh, get uh, their game more successful of course there is a, a situation of of money but we actually had have in romania quite a lot of mm -hmm. of developers who use a publisher not for money but just as a marketing tool yeah marketing you, services you, you do have a lot of services that are up for grabs and they are doing just this i'm they not talking not... about you know i'm not even yep. saying about translations uh, qa no, and, and other absolutely. things that that you need them and and a lot of Publishers, again, a lot of, sorry, developers, small ones, don't have testers, no. don't have. Uh, the resources yeah. are tight, obviously. So publishers have the uh, kind of a higher hand in this situation um, where they're kind of have the uh, the partners that can help out with PR, marketing and other services. And you can just focus on creating the game and finishing exactly. it uh and actually uh follow up the the milestones because you are going to be paid paid by milestones uh from publisher and um so in uh in this uh in this scenario is uh it is very tricky to find uh find a partner nowadays as i as i mentioned they are looking for almost impossible things to deliver um they are looking for games that could be thrown on the market pretty soon uh, or almost finished product um which exactly. probably it, which is probably not the case of uh, of a lot of studios out there because they might be kind of hitting a vertical slice or they might have a prototype and nothing else uh the pitching process is very very hard it takes months to actually get anything approved so if you think that you can your runway yeah. meaning that your budget is uh, is going to be depleted in i don't know by christmas uh you are too late to actually look for a publisher because no one is going to sign that fast. Um, there are, I mean, as I, as I mentioned, there are tons of publishers who are focusing only on certain types of games, uh, on certain, uh, within the certain budget, um, which is very low. Nowadays it is around mm. 500,000 500, to 1 million. Um, 
very rarely uh, they're signing something which is more expensive because right now everybody's playing very, very safely. And also what you have mentioned that uh, the perception of publishers uh, that can cut through the noise uh, is, no tr uh, is, uh, is not true anymore. Even those that have very large uh, audience and they can kind of cross promote, promote games, um, they can't actually succeed. And not everybody actually can uh, succeed because the content, uh, there's such a huge amount of content huge nowadays amount, there yeah. that even the established ones have uh, have trouble to uh, to do that. And it doesn't, uh, and, and, it, uh, and it's not just um, the indie publishers, but it's across the board. Um, some games obviously blew up on their own, which is amazing. Uh, if that happens to you, hats off uh, and just ride the wave. Do not sign anything. It's uh, just enjoy it. Um, but in many cases, uh, it is basically like a, winning a lottery ticket. Uh, and even when you sign on the publisher, which you already won a lottery at that point, you still actually do not have a guarantee that your game mm -hmm. is going to be successful and that it's going to gain um, uh, a huge uh, and start actually uh, selling really well after after the launch, even if your yeah. wish list is massive. So going back to the question, what would be a good yes. number? Well. I, I mentioned it already. Uh, 100k is, is a pretty safe bet. Like, yeah, uh, we will, we will, we will kind of look at it. Um, so, but, so nobody but, in Romania. You're yeah, we, we all have at least 100k. <laughs> but joking aside, like this is uh, something that I heard a couple of times that uh, they are asking these numbers, and then the question is like, what are you actually offering at this point when you already have that a huge audience uh, built? Because once you have 100k, your game was pretty, pretty uh, widely exposed. Um, but it doesn't have to be, obviously, uh, this kind of number, right? Uh, if you already have a Steam page and you have a kind of a good track record that you can actually show, um, I really can't tell. Uh, I have been pitching from a different position. Uh, so we are not talking about how many wish lists you have, but more or less what kind of team we, we have to build this game. Uh, so we, we I didn't have that kind of a conversation. Uh, so. I can't really tell. Uh, I would be uh, lying at this point. But the 100K, I, I heard a couple of times during Gamescom, which is ridiculous. Um, there is another question. It's actually uh, the same. Uh, it's our AI bot uh, on, on the channel. Uh, he's asking, what are some game niches that are a big no from the start for a publisher? Are there any hmm. dead genre? Uh, which I find a good question for uh, for uh, from him. Uh, um, so Gambling? Gambling is one of them. Uh, no one is touching that, even though there is an, a huge audience for that. But usually, these type of games are not being shown at the events that we have been talking about. Similarly yeah. to adult type of games, uh, which has a large uh, audience, obviously. Um, it is it is really interesting question because a lot of the the publishers will tell you if you if you find, if you find, uh, uh, if you have found a nice niche, uh, then we are actually interested in that, right? Um, because that niche could actually uh, lead to uh, to a large audience. So you really do not know. Um, lately, there has been a lot of card games uh, or deck builders. Uh, so nowadays, deck builders are com is a is a component of uh, of uh, of a combination. Of, of different different genres. So it's not just mm -hmm. deck building, but it's, I don't know, deck building survival slash roguelite slash Metroidvania, right? So the kind of the pure genres like Metroidvania, for example, you need to be as good or even better than Dead Cells, which is pretty tough. Uh, to <laughs> yeah. um, similarly to deck builders, right? So you have tons of them on mobile, you have tons of them on, on Steam as well. So you're actually competing with them. And if you can't be better than them, then you're not gonna, uh, you're not gonna succeed. And the publishers will actually not gonna touch that kind of a game. But if you combine these two uh, genres together in very interesting way, um, yesterday I was, uh, I was playing a roguelite uh, pachinko game. Uh, which was mm. which was very interesting, and you were putting kind of the new unlocks to the board and the 
and the ball was falling and generating was generating score which was which was very interesting right um and if you remember there was a small game uh poker game called balatro uh, and it blew out and it's a card game a traditional card game and look mm -hmm. at it um so i wouldn't i wouldn't be afraid of going into niches you have tools that can help you out to kind of count the audience or measure how big of an audience or the bleed between uh let's say uh deck builder and rpg is you have steam db you have uh you have others uh vg charts where you can actually measure these kind of games based on tags um you can compare uh some of the uh some of your favorite games uh if you're um if you are preparing a pitch you need to actually have some kind of comparable games uh and do uh um market research on that so uh i will look at it as well but again when you are doing this uh, research and working with data it kind of gives you a snapshot of what it is today it's not going to show yeah. you how it's going to be evolve in next year right next year there might be something else right sure. um we uh, uh jesus I, I was looking at the questions and uh i think i have like 50 more uh, but uh i i would like uh to, to try and wrap up the the discussion in about half an hour uh so Kota, uh, uh can you go through the questions that you have on publishing side and and uh pavel i will ask you to please uh um let's see if we can like uh quickly uh go through them because i have a section that i want us to discuss uh, about the industry in 2024 and, and going forward in 2025 yep. uh so uh half an hour it's uh, uh it's a challenge let's do it uh, so i wanted to ask first of all uh how do you think that the romanian game dev industry is viewed from outside mm -hmm. uh how does it compare maybe to other countries in in eastern europe because this sort will tie to my next question uh, regarding publishers it is uh it is very much uh very similar to slovakia um uh, in slovakia we do have pretty large uh, development studio but i think the majority uh companies uh, are working on behalf of someone else so they are outsourcing uh outsourcing a lot mm. uh very similar situation is in uh, is in portugal um these countries are being utilized uh as a uh, as a cheap labor if i would be very blunt yeah yeah um yeah. you you do have a lot of opportunities obviously to learn uh while working on larger titles with a larger team and large organizations um learning the processes learning the tools uh but then again if you do not have an uh, ecosystem built around that that is tied to universities that is tied to um kind of a capital either from uh from investors that are local coming from outside of the industry but also inside of the industry and obviously if you do not have any state support um you are kind of left on your own uh and you are relying on uh private educational program private uh maybe uh, schools or private uh kind of uh summer schools uh that are happening and they're trying to kind of capture and uh motivate uh, uh motivate the youngsters to get into the industry because there is still shortage of talent and shortage of talent um uh, is going to grow uh for sure right you have a lot of opportunities uh outside you do not have to move so you can actually work from your uh from your home uh, and be in a let's say cheaper country and have a nice salary um that and then you will you don't have to move and you yeah. have a very 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 comfortable life uh in that so considering that do you think that like if a publisher sees a pitch from a, a game studio in a in our country or a country in no. history or no. do you think that has any influence like they consider no. riskier or anything no no it it doesn't matter uh if the idea is uh, solid if the pitch is great it doesn't matter from where you're coming uh coming from they might actually consider it like look you are actually um coming or your studio is based in Romania or it's based in Portugal we know what is the kind of average salary there um mm -hmm. they might actually negotiate it around that 
um, when it comes to lowering, let's say, the, the overall dev budget. Um, but you are always asking for more, right? So you always have that room to negotiate uh, mm. with uh, mm. with a publisher or a partner. But it, mm. when Could it comes you... to ideas, it doesn't matter. There are no there are no kind of borders. There are no um, kind of thresholds that if you are coming from this country, we're not going to talk to you. you know? Could it help? Maybe the fact that uh, salaries here are somewhat lower than in other countries. Could it that help? Absolutely. Or... Absolutely. If you have access to a great talent and you can actually prove that you can deliver, then you can actually uh, land pretty nice, uh, pretty nice deals. Um, and not just from publishers, but if you consider codef or outsourcing, uh, you are actually have um, upper hand compared to Western Europe. And Western, in your case, I'm meaning Poland already, which is still e considered Eastern Europe. Uh, so like the larger market even even our almost neighbors are becoming western europe and we're still yeah. eastern <laughs> yeah we are still <laughs> we western are still europe east. <laughs> is starting from the border our border uh what what does a a, a publisher considers a great pitch hmm. that's a very good question uh if you see, I mean, you can observe, if you're meeting in person, you can observe the body language. Uh, you can observe if the person is looking at the screen or looking at you when you are explaining, or if you are having, you're in kind of a defensive position with your kind of hands uh, crossed, or if they are leaning forward, that means that they are very interesting. Mm -hmm. If they are looking at the phone, you know that it's something's wrong, uh, something's wrong. Or if they are looking at, a, uh, at the watch, it's something wrong, uh, either with how the pitch is being presented or the pitch itself. Um, and, and in terms of, of slides, are there any slides that are, that are like a must have? There are, there are actually good kind of templates that are out there. I think Rami Ismail did one. Uh, then I think Gwen Foster uh, from, is she with Among Us or not anymore? Or I'm confusing with someone, someone else. Um, uh, she did a template as well, uh, mm. what needs to be in a, in a good kind of a pitch. But obviously, you need to make it on your own. It can't be just like you will follow uh, exactly. uh, follow the template. It needs to stand out. Obviously, if you are uh, if you are looking for um, for a publisher, it needs to be very gripping. It needs to be very nice to look at. It needs to have gifs inside instead of videos. Uh, it needs to be polished uh i think over polished i would say and is there uh, any it, kind of information that like it's really important for them to hear and you should have missed to have it in terms of like maybe well, i don't know market research that you did on your own or cost development yeah. cost or you yeah. know we have been they, we have been talking about the relationship right uh, right so in uh in this case they need to know what kind of team is going to be working on it, right? Uh, obviously, so info they are meeting, about the team is a must. Okay. Info about the team or info about the key people that are going to be mm. working on it, right? They are going to be meeting with you or maybe with your uh, uh, co-founder mm. or maybe your right hand, uh, but they do not know the rest, right? If it's a game that has a standing, uh, outstanding art, it needs to be art director presented there, right? Like, look, this mm. is why, uh, wh why we actually uh, created this this way and. If it's very art driven, then the pitch needs to be art driven as well. It mm. needs to look pretty. Um, so uh, team info, obviously not to have it in way too many slides. One slide uh, is, yeah. uh, is more than enough. You need to have the USPs there describing why the game uh, is unique and why they should actually invest in it, uh, which is also very important because you are asking them for money. And the question mm. is like why they should actually invest. Uh, so the team, the game, uh, and obviously the dev budget needs to be uh, somehow broken down into different stages. Uh, you need to be ready as well uh, to kind of scale down a little bit the budget. Uh, if they tell you, okay, you're not going to get half a million, you will get 300,000, how much or how much you need to cut from the game, if it's even possible. Mm -hmm. um, this is also, uh, also important. Obviously, you need but to have something... <laughs> In so terms of, would, you, would, would you go, recommend go, 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 that you that you ask for a bit mm. more money so that you absolutely have from where absolutely absolutely you just don't count it like the bare minimum you need to have a nice kind of cushion uh, 
Free ball because, time. Yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, it depends yeah, well, on your, usually, on, on your burn, you know, rate, burn rate, but you always, you always ask for more uh, uh, because you do have unexpected situations. You might need someone um, else for the team uh, and you can actually have that from the budget. Uh, there might be a slight delay uh, within uh, the production, which is always happening. Uh, so you need to account that as well. Um, there might be, I don't know, there might be sickness in the team. There might be, I don't know, flooding uh, of the building where you're uh, sitting. Yeah. I mean, yeah. these things can happen and can delay the production, right? Um, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but you need to be kind of prepared also for worst case scenarios. In, in case, in, in terms of numbers, uh, mm -hmm. Do do you do you know for for uh, forecast to be something interesting because that uh, it's a big challenge for a lot of especially you know aspiring developers mm -hmm. to make forecasts because they 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 don't know exactly you know how to to make estimation on how successful their game will be and because yeah. ninety nine percent of our games when they were pitched were like huge successes. And um, we had only three, <laughs> so yeah, uh, we, doing something wrong. We have been we have been mentioning the uh, the tools, right? Uh, the uh, Steam Spy. Not sure if it's still uh, actual, but VG Charts is pretty nice, where you can look at Steam DB as well. Uh, they are listing. You can list very similar titles uh, and do market research on them. How much they sold. Um, yeah, but uh, do you go for yeah. the big hitters or do you go for like the median? Do you go for the lowest cases? So again, right? If you are uh, if you are making uh, the next uh, dead cells killer, you need to com mm. be compared to dead cells, right? So okay, dead mm. cells all around this. So there is a large audience out there. Will every single one will buy your game? Probably not. Um, so you need to kind of lower your uh, expectations, and I would go uh, with the uh, not the bare minimum, but I would go with kind of a um, uh, three tiers to be overly positive, uh, then uh, then successful, and then a little bit kind of let's say not disappointed, but successful, right? Uh, so have these uh, three kind of uh, number of uh, number of copies sold. Uh, based on um, based on uh, the games that you're borrowing ideas or they are being that you are being inspired by. Um, obviously, you're not going to go for for the top sellers, but you will go with something which is uh, in the middle of it um, that will give you a ideal snapshot of how much you can actually sell, uh, how much you can sell. Does it worse to to pitch a publisher a game that you don't want to do a demo? So you basically have no wish list uh, uh, numbers to look at. They might actually look at it uh, if the idea is uh, enticing and interesting. They might actually get back to you, but they will require a demo or a playable or a video or something or at least a prototype. They call it prototype with a beauty corner, where mm -hmm. you can still demonstrate the game idea uh, with gray box uh, environment okay. and then have one or two kind of i don't know let's say rooms uh where you are actually showing off uh the art direction where you're showing off almost uh almost uh, final assets how it's going to look but without the gameplay where you can just look uh yeah, yeah like a gray box indeed um so, so you don't need a public demo but you do need something playable well, when you are talking to them, obviously, that's going to be the first requirement. Uh, they might look at the PDF without without any uh, any video or any demo, uh, but that's gon not going to uh, secure you, you or, yeah. or anything yeah. like that, right? Lovely. Uh, Kata, do you have any questions on, on publishers? For, for I mean, I, I believe we can sit all day talking about publishers, but at least for, for right I'm, now. I'm, I'm good for now. <laughs> Oh, because I want uh, us to to quickly switch a bit the discussion to to a more global uh, approach to the industry. Uh, 2024 uh, was um, uh, a strange year from many perspective because on one side um, it still uh, is. 
Uh, okay. It still is, but it's uh, it's uh, it's the year where we had like a huge amount of blockbusters games being released. Uh, mm -hmm. We, uh, for example, in Romania, it's the most prolific, if I can call it like this, year of the game industry for so many levels. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the year where we have the most education programs that. Uh, uh, tackle game development. It's the year where we had the biggest numbers of game released uh, created by Romanian developers. It's the year when we had um, some of the most successful games, um, financially, financially speaking, yeah, yeah uh, in in our history. Uh, so, um, but in the same context, it's the year where we still see a huge amount of layoffs, a huge amount of uh, closing, sorry, uh, studio closing. A uh, huge amount of of disappointing news about uh, you know the industry, yep. and um, what hap what happened from your point of view? Where is twenty twenty four sitting? And of course, we can follow it up with uh, what are your twenty twenty five expectations? And uh, the, I... probably the biggest question that will keep it towards the end is: yes. Will we ever have uh, years like before the pandemic? <laughs> um... We could start with that because 2024 is very, very depressing, uh, and uh, we have seen a lot of. Uh, a lot I, of I don't think the answer for that question will be more, uh, <laughs> more happy. I mean, yeah, um, let's go. Let's go. Uh, do you think that we'll have years like before the pandemic, like 2018? I don't think we will. We will. I hope that we will, but I don't. Th I don't think we <laughs> okay. will because we will use different tools to make games. Uh, there's going to be uh, new platforms that you can publish uh, and new stores where you can publish your games. So the whole landscape is changing, right? Uh, our habits of playing games uh, are changing as well. And we're seeing it now, I mean, since 2022, that the AAA industry is basically doomed. Uh, and we're not going to see the big, big games the blockbusters coming out every single month, uh, or you will be having like the Christmas around October, November, where multiple of these huge games will be released. Um, the distribution model is changing. Um, the, the way how we uh, play the games and consume the games and access the games is changing, right? Even the, the most conservative players are utilizing maybe mobile to stream some of the games via xCloud. Uh, me included, for example, I'm kind of keen to um, uh, play games this way because it's convenience, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, you have players shifting from consoles to PC and, and vice versa. Uh, you have whole countries uh, preferring one platform over, um, over other, which is Japan currently. Um, there is a huge influx of... Uh, uh, of PC uh, and Steam gamers over there. Um, so I hope that we will have uh, more games and I hope that we will have amazing experiences uh, in the future. I really do not know how it's gonna pan out. Uh, it's really hard to uh, kind of predict when it's gonna stop because 2024 is, we still have two months to go, two and a half months to go. And I believe there's gonna be more layoffs. There are gonna be more studio closures um, because in some cases it might have been just a very short term very short term um, kind of a solution uh, and the market conditions are not improving you yeah. still see kind of good things happening as well uh, which are kind of lost in the noise you see new games being announced from newly formed teams and they are actually very interesting ideas you do see uh, new studios being opened uh, with a significant financial backing even though the rest of the industry is struggling so there is kind of everyone is struggling currently right it's not just indies because they're fighting the influx of content out there it is not just uh, smaller companies. Uh, it is across the board, uh, publishers, well-established brands. Um, there is a lot of, uh, it almost sounds like a purge that 
uh, a lot of the bad practices are being called out. A lot of the bad kind of management is being punished by uh, layoffs, unfortunately, and uh, with closures. Um, and uh, it is not a good place to be uh, right now, even though it is one of the best industries out there that has the most uh, engaged uh, and the most lovely people uh, mm. out there. It is very tough. It is very rough, and there has been a lot of, a lot of these kind of predictions like, "Oh, you need to power through and survive till 2025." But if you do, what then? Right? Uh, it's not going to magically the, the, change. <laughs> the, yeah, there is the, expectation that 2025 is going to be amazing. The, the, the problem with yes. with with what's happening and the, the expectation for 2025, the way I see it, is that. Um, Gaming right now is become not actually not gaming, but game development has become more accessible than ever. Yeah. Uh, with everything that uh, you have at your disposal to create games, and especially you know with the added uh, um, emergence of the AI uh, in, in the recent years. So uh, when you go look forward, basically you will actually see even more games. But yep. you still have the same user base. You know, we are still 7 billion people on, on the yes. planet. Um, and uh, since the pandemic, and, you know, the consuming is, is decreased because people, people are out of the houses. And moreover, yes. right now, making video games is probably the most expensive as it has ever been. Uh, so you have the cost of making games is higher than ever. The yes. amount of video games are uh, it's higher than ever. And the amount of people who are paying is not the highest ever. Uh, yeah. So uh, you have uh, this situation that don't make 2025 look uh, any better. How can you, you still have, you still do have uh, increased uh, audience on Steam, which is giving you a little bit of hope that the, uh, that the player base is still growing. Mm -hmm. uh, while in other areas is a little bit shrinking, uh, console players or the console uh, install base is not growing as uh, as expected. Um, but like, come on, PS Pro is only seven hundred euros. Yes. What? Why? Why do people complain? I don't get it. It's eight hundred uh, in Europe. That's eight hundred. Yeah. Eight hundred. <laughs> you yeah, you well, optimist. I, <laughs> I, I I was hoping for a good uh, good deal, but yeah, Black Friday yeah. is it's around the corner, guys. Uh, yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah. like, like, in, like what you say, and, and and I agree with you. Just to add a bit of of good things on on all the bits uh -huh. things I said, uh, we are also you know uh, our generation because we probably were among the first generation of of video makers. You know, started yep. in the early nineties. Um, now our generation is is at the peak of they are you know parents the the kids were born in a, in a digital era they grew up with console and with games and so the market is probably again the, the biggest in terms of how many people consume video games and uh, you know we'll probably still be playing game, video games at 50 60 years you know even more uh, that our parents or or our grandparents didn't play games mm. at, at that age um but again, uh, for 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 a business perspective, you know, it doesn't seem like everything that's happening around outcomes the positives uh, that we hope that they will become true. So, with this in mind, again, why should we make games in twenty twenty five? You are you are correct. There is still audience, right? We are still um, looking to play interesting interesting games and you you need to think about that interactive media is the only media entertainment uh, in the entertainment industry that uh, is functioning almost like a teleport that it yeah. actually can teleport you to new worlds and you are engaged more than with watching a tv series or reading a book or watching a movie obviously you are fighting uh, for for the attention because the the day still has 24 hours uh, and there are still good movies and amazing TV series out there that you want to watch so you are fighting with them but the power of uh, uh, of interactive media is in the way how the story is being told how you are actually being teleported to the world how you are actually being the main character this is still 
the the unique selling point that none other can kind of compete with um plus we actually grew up with uh with playing uh with playing games and we want to still uh have new experiences right uh that mm. maybe feel a little bit nostalgic mm. but uh you still want to you still want to explore new genres you still want to play the next big thing um so i think that's the um that's something that we are forgetting uh, about um the the power of uh of the interactive uh, interactivity in uh, in games yeah that's that's uh, a beautiful answer but at at the end of, so I, i'd like to say this first from my point of view doing games as a business currently mm. is somewhat i'll just use a bad word it's somewhat dumb if you want to do business and you think yeah. oh, i'm going to do business because i'm going to make a lot of money that's kind of dumb either you have a lot of background and you know how to make this as a successful business it probably it's not going to be you selling games it's going to be you making games for other people mm. right that's definitely <laughs> more money making in that so i love your answer because at the end of the day i think we should make games because we are creators because we want to tell stories because we want to make experience we want to uh make people feel stuff but not necessarily as a business how do you do you answer to that as a business strictly is it a good time from your point of view is it still a good time to be making games it is you have access to tools which are available for free uh when you start earning revenue until certain threshold you can actually and you will be i think not forced but you are uh, required to actually pay a licensing fee um to unreal for example right uh, yeah. the tools are available for free um you have immense uh, resource uh where you can learn where you can uh ask questions uh before that we didn't have we didn't have these um uh, these these kind of tools um and my dog come somebody is missing you hello. yeah yeah so you do have you do have immense opportunities uh compared to where we started right there was not a lot of yeah. there was not a lot of books there were not a lot of resources there were not a lot of courses there were not a lot of even the conferences or uh, uh or events where you can uh, could get educated plus we were not connected right in many countries even before uh i mean even after the uh the uh, uh, uh internet the communities were still uh separated they didn't even know that in the next apartment building there are developers right that happened yeah. here in croatia for example um so we are more connected we have more access to knowledge we have more access to talent we have more access to to tools so it is uh uh easier or it should be easier to make games on the other side from the business perspective everyone can make games right so you are actually have immense competition you have immense um uh not immense but you have like your chances are shrinking to be picked by a publisher your chances are shrinking to be uh picked on steam and put on a uh, on a homepage because the amount of games published by c or actually being released on steam is 14000 uh yeah. until yeah. uh now and it's still growing right which is crazy but i i i i don't think it's actually even this kind of problem that more people are making games i think i think the effect of this is that the quality because it's one of the complaints we had about games we uh, release in romania yeah we released the biggest amount of games this year but the quality of yeah. the games was not competitive with with what's on the market and the biggest problem if you put it in a financial way is that like maybe five years ago that game was good quality for yeah. that amount of time now games take so much more time yep. because you still want to do it in three four people you know uh, as a team but you have so much more quality to invest in because the others are doing it and you need to compete with them absolutely uh, so, i mean the know, the downside the downside of uh, of uh, of games industry is that we are driven by tech uh, right yeah. so um you need to 
quickly adapt or actually have an idea that can kind of work even running on, I don't know, an older version of, uh, or previous version of, uh, of Unreal or previous version of uh, uh, whatever tool uh, you're using. Um, so in that sense, you need to be very creative. And also I'm um, coming back to the, to the big, big kind of productions. Um, the main reason why a lot of a lot of these games were uh, or studios are are failing because the whole method or the kind of fundamentals of making games needs to change. They are too expensive to make, and there is not a lot of actually revenue that is being brought back from the market, right? Um, so that while the market is changing, the way how we make games uh, was not uh, kind of changed for. And with this in mind, Pavel, what do you think about current biggest models? Let's take Game Pass. Uh, I am a Game Pass subscriber, right? Uh, I, I am a huge fan of it uh, because it it kind but of exposes no, no, no. me. If, 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 yeah, but from a game gamer perspective, right? Yes, it it ex yeah. th this is absolutely brilliant, right? It's it's brilliant. You have one subscription. You have tons of games over there. Uh, you don't have to do anything, right? If you have the ultimate, you are on PC on console. It's perfect. But from as a developer. Business, from the business <laughs> perspective and the developer, you are, again, facing a huge competition because everybody wants to be on Game Pass, right? Uh, game Pass doesn't guarantee you that your game is going to be successful. Uh, a lot of the games were published recently, and they are lovely. Uh, they are uh, they're beautiful, but no one is actually playing them. Uh, so it's not a guarantee. Then you have the, the other... Um, um, other kind of a challenge where Xbox is Xbox is becoming a gatekeeper. Um, so yeah. they right now they are being very picky. Uh, they are and actually signing what 10, 20 games a month. That's ridiculously uh, low compared to how many games are yes. made. Yes, because they grew the audience, and right now they are dictating. Um, and they have terms. They have different terms. Uh, developers are getting. Uh, less incentives uh, for signing up for uh, for Game Pass. Uh, so obviously that actually created a, kind of a gatekeeping mechanism where they are basically uh, acting as an apple. It's very similar. Exactly. Yeah. You are you you have only few slots uh, to sign, which is unfortunate. <laughs> but this is how uh, how business works, uh, unfortunately. And similar for PlayStation Plus, it's yeah. it's the same thing. Uh, talking about PlayStation Plus, um, what do you think about the current cycle we are in, um, which is an emergence of the PC um, gamer base uh, and and the downfall of the console, um, which like if you were going on forums ten years ago, everybody was singing the the lullaby uh, song for the, the PC way, yeah. because. Uh, yes. They were dying, and the consoles were taking over the world. Uh, do you think the cycle will repeat, or do you think that consoles have uh, where they cannot win uh, in with the current tech and with the current emerging tech? Uh, it is a it is a con games? it is a convenience, right? It's it it comes down to this. Uh, I am a huge proponent of having a dedicated device that can play games. Um, I am fortunate enough to have uh, both platforms, uh, PlayStation 5 and Xbox, even though I'm not playing on them uh, the same amount of time or every single day. Mm. But I like to have a device that plays just games, uh, that doesn't force me to open emails or uh, <laughs> you are one app from a trouble, right? Opening up, I don't know, your Teams or Slack or something like that. Um, and you so see them re-emerging as, as uh, you know, market drivers like, the way, like they were ten years ago. If you if you look at if you look at what PlayStation is doing currently with the ports, and if you look at how um, the Xbox strategy changed, and suddenly there are no more exclusives, there are only timed exclusives, uh, and you will see games uh, exclusively developed by Xbox Studios published on other platforms. Right? It already started happening. Uh, with some of the titles appearing on PlayStation 5. Not sure if it's going to be vice versa, probably not. But uh, PlayStation is looking at PC as a, as a viable market uh, and players are actually uh, um, 
reacting to it accordingly. Uh, they're playing the big games that were supposed to be locked into a platform and they're playing it on, on Steam. So I think this is uh, moving forward. Um, this is going to be uh, this is going to be the new uh, new normal uh, for for the big platforms. And then you have more choices uh, to play the games, either if it's going to be on PC and you will wait a couple of months uh, in case of PlayStation uh, with Xbox, you can actually play it immediately. Uh, you do not have to have an ex dedicated kind of box under the under the TV. Um, and in the end, if we might see, I don't know, if if there is no console after PlayStation 6 or the, the Xbox, whatever next one is going to be called, um, I wouldn't mind. Um, because back then, uh, at that time, we would have, I don't know, way too powerful TVs uh, on their own. They will have computers uh, in it that can actually stream or actually run the games mm -hmm. even from your PC uh, that you have. So you will always have a de device that can play games uh, in the end. If it's the streaming, I really do not know. Uh, even the Parsec currently, we are using it uh, at our studio. It works really nice. It works really, really good even for for action games. Um, but it's But you can actually feel it that it's streamed that it's not made mm. if that the delay is uh, is there, right? It might improve with the uh, fastest networks. Uh, I really don't know. Once you can't notice and it's more convenient for you, uh, then it doesn't matter where you're actually playing with whichever controller, right? Um, speaking of uh, trends and you know business in, in the industry, what do you think about this, um, you know, uh, this, shift for at least for the younger audience mm -hmm. to focus mostly on playing the same game for years and years on end and you know like the emergence of this major well I, i'm not going to call them blockbusters like this major uh magnets of of the audience like do you have probably millions of people that play only fortnite and or mm -hmm. tens of millions of hundreds of millions. I don't know how, how much they have yeah. now. And then they have Genshin Impact. And then they have, I don't know what, not Valorant or whatever. Uh, and like it or not, I think these big titles tend to suck up a lot of the audience from the market. Yeah. Uh, audience who is now, and especially younger audience, audience who isn't willing to try new experiences like try indie games or try, as you said, the big AAA titles that companies still try to produce. Uh, do you think that will exacerbate in the future? Uh, it might, for sure. Uh, I mean, I have been part of that community as well. I was a huge and avid fan of Destiny uh, when it came out. That was the only game that I was playing for, I think, until Destiny 2. Um, and I was playing it daily um there was still time to play other games because daily you can just go for a few missions you will grind something and you just log off uh but we have to take a we have to look at it the the uh, the audience even from the perspective because a lot of the people are using it as a social space uh mm -hmm. they're not doing anything else they might be i don't know building something in in fortnite they might not shoot each other and they are building something together uh, and while they are talking uh, or while they are hanging out, right? Um, obviously, there are people who are playing it competitively, uh, those that are playing it hardcore. Uh, but I do believe a lot of, a lot of the player base uh, are using it as a, as a social space. Um, and they might have actually found right. a perfect game that kind of calms them down if they are uh anxious or if they have a bad day uh, because they can escape really quickly into a very familiar world where they play 15 20 maybe 30 minutes uh they will log off and they will kind of calm down and they can go uh go on uh and continue with the with their day uh, there are multiple games and uh in, in my case as well i i have a couple of those that are i'm calling them like a comfort food uh where you, you're kind of hungry and you don't want to cook you just i don't know order pizza uh, it's very similar. You have that kind of a game. We don't want to think about what happened previously in the story. Uh, and you, you know that you have, I don't know, 30, uh, 30 minutes to play. You will play two matches in, I don't know, Overwatch or, or, or something, and you just log off. Uh, and you just don't want to continue uh, 
your cyberpunk story or final fantasy 16 story like the grand uh, grand big games because they tend to be uh story heavy and the missions are pretty long right um yeah so diablo 4 is perfect example uh mm -hmm. right now is my getaway game uh just open up run one dungeon 15 minutes i'm gone i'm done and logging off there was actually a, a post uh, I, I don't remember where i saw it uh with a guy who did a, a, a kind of research like this uh, based on achievements in video games mm -hmm. And uh, he, the the conclusion was that the amount of games being bought by people but never played is higher is is getting yep. higher because again uh, people don't have the 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 time to to play it or the amount of games is 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 uh, way too too big. Um, That's true. And then you everything. think about like why the games are being made bigger and larger, right? Why do we why do we have such a huge open worlds when only a fraction of players or a fraction of owners of the game will actually finish it, right? So yeah. that's, that's a, I think, a different topic. Yeah. This is somewhat what, what worries me, because we, when we look at Steam data uh, or, you know, general data, uh, we're always told, well, the audience at least is still increasing. And, my, like, my question is, is it, though? Is it increasing? I mean, at least in the, in the younger uh, audience, I really don't think that the audience for gaming in general increases. I think that audience goes specifically to what I call uh, TikTok studios. Those those games are TikTok studios. They use them so they generate their their TikTok videos and whatever other social platforms young people use <laughs> these days. Yep. There has been a couple of a um, uh, uh, couple of record-breaking numbers uh, coming from SteamDB that measures actually the active users uh, and it's actually growing. Um, so these, it's not just creating accounts, but actually being active and playing something, mm -hmm. uh, which is which is still being increased and the old records are being broken. So I think we are seeing uh, the shift towards PC um, and, and, and actually spending more time playing games on PC, right? Um, it doesn't provide you any data what kind of games are being played. I mean, mm -hmm. you can still list of them. Uh, you, you can actually look at how many players are being, uh, uh, how many players are playing the, the top games. Uh, uh, but uh, we we do not have similar data to uh, to mobiles, right? We do not know uh, how much time is being spent on the top games, uh, and obviously how much time people are spending in uh, uh, in games in VChat, for example, which is a which mm -hmm. is a new thing. And I think will, it will come down here very quickly as well um, in TikTok fashion way, where you have bite-sized uh, bite-sized games that are immediate, no loading, nothing like that, uh, minute or two uh, while you're waiting for a bus or waiting for a recess and, uh, and just uh, changing it very quickly in uh, in reels, uh, maybe that's a fire and forget. Direction we can follow. <laughs> you know, there is, al there is already the games. Th there is already a platform that is actually doing yeah. that. Yeah, so. five second games. Uh, where, where do you see? Uh, because we talked so much about console and PC, where do you see the the mobile games um, going in twenty twenty five? That is a very tough question that I can't answer. I I'm not well versed with the with the mobile industry. I know that they are facing very difficult times currently with the user acquisition and how expensive it is to actually yeah. get people play their games or play the games that they are advertising. Uh, the business model is staying the same. It is free to play, uh, so not a lot of premium games, uh, not a lot of uh, games that you can uh, pay or actually play with one-time purchase. Uh, Apple Arcade is still there, but it's very hard to get in, and Apple is not investing heavily in it. Um, so it's really hard to tell. It's still growing because every single kid has a mobile phone now. Uh, so of course, it's uh, the audience is going to play games on it. Uh, I don't believe that uh, they're going to be averse to uh, video games, and they're not going to be wanting to play whatever their schoolmates are playing, uh, especially when you can actually play together. Um, 
So it's going to grow, but the monetization model, I'm not a huge fan of it. It is pretty predatory. Uh, it is exploitative. Uh, and uh, uh, it's not good. Sometimes the games are not even entertainment. Uh, <laughs> they are distilled, distilled kind of psychology into uh, how how to withdraw all the money from your wallet uh, or from the pocket of uh, of parents in case of uh, smaller children. So uh, I really don't know, but it's growing. Um, and and uh, last at least for from me, uh, how do you see the the emergence of new stores? Uh, you know, um, Microsoft, uh, PlayStation announced it. Yep. Um, do you think this will help the industry or or divide it even more? If they give the platform or the new stores to new companies and new stores, so the new games can kind of shine uh then yes there is a hope if they're going to bring all the candy crush saga and all the clash of clans <laughs> or clash of whatever then there is no alternative right it's going to be the same audience they might actually flock to uh, to a new store but there is a hope that they with the new stores uh, they might actually create alternative and hopefully uh new games and new developers will will benefit from it uh lovely Good. Uh, yeah are there any questions uh yeah just, I mean, just, we still just, have time we, we just started <laughs> just a couple but you know feel free to answer them as shortly as you want <laughs> i know it's late so one of the the big trends lately was this you know shift to online uh, work remote work uh mm -hmm. but then at least the way i see it lately there's been the the reverse of that with more and more companies going to hybrid or even full on site uh yep. do you think that's true do you think that online work will slowly dial down until you know it's, it's not as prevalent as today it is uh, it depends on the company it depends how the management uh how aggressive the management is i guess uh our studio for example was founded in october 2020 uh we do have offices we are not forcing anyone to go into the office even though if they have the desk over there and they have computers where they can actually work on um we are 100 plus uh studio uh we are actually fully remote we are giving our employees an option if you want to go uh you have a place to actually sit. Um, we, are, we are actually utilizing the hot desk uh, uh, method in, in our studio. Um, so it depends on the companies. It depends on how the studio is structured. Uh, since we are working with multiple teams, we are not working just as a single team. It's quite easier. Uh, and it's uh, even, I think, more comfortable to work from home rather than from a studio. Uh, what I have seen, and I'm coming from um, uh, from kind of an older school where I like to be surrounded with people, uh, that I would prefer to have at least two days uh, in the office. I miss my uh, coworkers. I miss my teammates. Um, and the way, uh, and not the way, but uh, since we were commuting, you are actually kind of exposed to different external stimuli. Uh, different sounds, different uh, people. So your brain works a little bit different when you're just waking up and going from your bedroom to uh, to your uh, workstation and you just work and then go to a kitchen, uh, have a meal, and then just go back to uh, work. And then maybe in the evening, you just watch a TV. Um, so this is just me, uh, how I see it. I don't think it will gonna gonna go away. I don't think uh, the, uh, um, the studios uh, will be again, like fully uh, on site. Um, we have seen that it works. We have seen and we have proven um, that the games can be delivered completely remote. Of course, it needs to change a little bit the production. It needs to change a little bit uh, in, in the processes, but it is doable. Uh, and I don't think it's gonna go back. There might be still companies who will adopt re hybrid mode or they will mm -hmm. uh, be forcing people to, uh, to have everybody on site, but they are risking that the people will just say goodbye and they will find a new job. Uh, and lastly, uh, in the past, there were 
kind of resets. So when Nintendo Switch was launched, it was kind of a reset, at least as a, as a business, you know, as a game development yeah. business, because it was a new platform. If you got there fast enough, you had tons of opportunities. Same was mm-hmm. for PS4. Same was for mm-hmm. Xbox One. Uh, well, maybe not for Xbox One. But lately, everything is backwards compatible. Everything that launches new already has thousands or tens of thousands of games in there. <laughs> we, do you think we will ever have a chance for a like a, at least a little reset anymore so you know like a little opportunity where you can yeah plug yourself I, in and get give ourselves a chance a chance to to fight i know what you mean uh i think a lot of uh, a lot of us are looking at uh, the switch 2 or whatever is going to be the uh, successor the switch successor name even though it is claimed that it's going to be backwards co- compatible and same what uh with xbox series it is backwards compatible even to the first generation of xbox yeah. i mean not not all of the games you can play um but the new systems will have new features uh that only the new games will kind of utilize um so in that sense you want to have the best and the uh and the uh, and the cutting edge uh, when you are first adopter so you will go actually for the versions that are supporting the new hardware same goes for the next PlayStation uh, or or the next Xbox. I think they might be, obviously they will be prettier. The games will be prettier. They might be a new controller that will have an enhanced rumble or it will have, I don't know, different features with a microphone or with the touchpad uh, in, in case mm-hmm. of PlayStation. So in that sense, you want to have, you want to experience that. So I don't think we will have the full reset. Um, there is uh, a huge kind of a player base that is demanding that they're, library is going to be transferable um i have a lot of games that were bought digitally but nowadays i'm switching to kind of have a disc version um but uh i would i would actually uh love to play my old games as well on the on the new platform i'll just change the change the box uh have a more powerful console that can uh handle the new games while i can still return back to um to those that i played played before so basically, we're doomed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah but, but the b- problem with it's that, you know, you still have the same distribution channels. You have the yes. same, same big players who are, you know, yeah. featured. It's, it's basically in terms of development, there is nothing changing from you. You still have to deal with the same, uh, yep. you, the same business mm-hmm. while a completely new device, hopefully, um, it will happen. Uh, maybe we'll have a fourth player coming on the market. Maybe you know something that happens with with AR, uh, a, a VR uh, uh, will, will lead to emergent uh, new devices that will, like you said, we are uh, uh, an industry reliant of technology. So uh, probably when something uh, new will appear that will disrupt current models. Uh, and should be about time because iPhone is getting 20 years old. Um, we will probably have again, uh, like Catalin um, uh, wanted, uh, an opportunity for developers to um, be present and then, uh, you know, get the big uh, pile of the pie. Because right now, even if you do new generation, the pie is the same. Yep. Yeah, um, that's true. Well, Guys, uh, we have one minute and 20 seconds until we reach the three hours mark. It's the longest episode we ever did by far. Uh, wow. And um, I want uh, to, to, to put an end on it so everybody can sleep, uh, can wake up uh, for those who, who, who went to sleep. Uh, listening to us, um, like, like usually, uh, we want to thank, uh, thank everybody for... for uh, um, uh, listening and watching the the podcast. Um, hopefully, now you have three hours. So you have more time at work to to watch uh, us uh, in the next day once the episode goes on on YouTube. Uh, and uh, as always, uh, don't forget to to leave comments, to share your thoughts, to uh, tell us what else we, you you like to to uh, hear us debate with with our uh, with our guests. Um, if I'm missing anything, Catalin, now is the time to like, comment, uh, share, subscribe. I, I just yes. want to say thank you so much, uh, Pavel. Uh, it was 
quite an amazing uh, uh, talk. Definitely, I think the best that we had so far with with, with the guests here, and uh, we're very grateful for uh, all the very detailed answers that uh, that you gave us, and especially for like your. Uh, or your insight from your point of view as someone from outside our industry who can you know give us that glimpse into how things are viewed from another place not just inside here between us local developers so thank you so much yeah well thank you for having me and thank you everybody for uh for listening so uh hopefully next time yeah and we'll, we'll probably do do a next one uh sometime maybe we'll discuss in 2025 about uh you know how the 2024 ended, uh, how 2025 is shaping up. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll keep in touch. Um, usually, uh, like Pavel said, you can um, befriend him on, on LinkedIn uh, and, uh, and get in touch directly if you if you want. Uh, if if not, you can uh, let your questions in, in the comments and, and uh, I will make sure that uh, Pavel will will see them, and when he has time, uh, we'll try to to answer to for those questions. Uh, with this in mind, uh, we'll hear it and see each other for the next episode, which will be around 30 October, uh, two weeks from now, uh, when we'll probably do a spooky Halloween uh, episode. And um, uh, keep uh, following us on social media to see when we announce what will happen with the next episode. And in the meantime, like Catalin said, like, comment, share, subscribe, and everything else that is necessary for us to reach 100,000 um, views per episode. So Wish we can list. find publishers. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we can find publishers for our talk show uh, and, and podcast. Thank you, everybody. Have a good sleep. Uh, and uh, thank you again, Pavel, for being so long with us. Thank you. Have a good one. Good one. Good night. Bye. Bye.